January 1945, the fifth year of the war. The Allies are beating the life and soul out of Hitler and Hitlerism. front, the Red Army is crushing the Germans along the entire border of East Prussia. On the Western Front, the Anglo-American forces stand on the German frontier, ready to spring at the Nazis in their lair. Such was the military position. The political situation was by no means so satisfactory. The whole shape and structure of post-war Europe clamored for review. When the Nazis were beaten, how was Germany to be treated? And once military aims were achieved, what measures and what organization could the three great allies provide for the future peace and good governance of the world? In search of the answers, Churchill journeys to Yalta. Yalta, in peacetime, a Soviet vacation resort in the Black Sea. The Prime Minister is disturbed to learn that President Roosevelt plans to stay no more than five or six days. With the issue of world peace at stake, Churchill replies, I do not see any way of realizing our hopes about world organization in five or six days. Even the Almighty took seven. From all reports I had received about conditions at Yalta, we could not have found a worse place for a meeting if we'd spent 10 years in looking for it. The Germans had evacuated the area only 10 months earlier and the surrounding buildings had been badly damaged. Over a thousand men had been at work on the scene before our arrival. Every effort was made by our hosts to ensure our comfort. On one occasion, somebody said that there was no lemon peel in the cocktails. The next day, a lemon tree loaded with fruit was growing in the hall. The uh, Russians had done everything they possibly could for our comfort and entertainment. But of course, they had to be trained in the matter of an English breakfast. Um, caviar and mince pies for breakfast are all very well once in a way, but they begin to pull after a bit. However, we soon managed to initiate them into the mysteries of some of the simpler egg dishes. When it got into its stride, the conference routine was more or less like this. Um, every morning at half past 11, a meeting of the three foreign secretaries with their delegations at one of the delegation headquarters, followed by lunch. And then at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, a meeting of the big three. The first meeting of the conference begins on February 5. Stalin opens the discussion by asking how Germany is to be dismembered. I said that we all agreed that Germany should be dismembered, but the actual method was much too complicated to be settled in five or six days. Personally, I hardly like to consider dismembering Germany until my doubts about Russia's intentions had been cleared away. Russia insists on partition, and the three great powers finally agree to divide Germany into four zones occupied by the United States, Great Britain, 
France, and Russia. Churchill is still concerned over its future. We now have a chance of avoiding the errors of previous generations and of making a sure peace. People cry out for peace and joy. Will the families be reunited? Will the warrior come home? Will the shattered dwellings be rebuilt? Before us lies the realization of the dream of the poor, that they shall live in peace protected by our invincible power from aggression and evil. Otherwise, the oceans of bloodshed will have been useless and outrageous. Nations, comrades in arms, have in the past drifted apart within five or ten years of the war. What will be the position in a year or two when the British and American armies have melted and when Russia may choose to keep two or three hundred divisions on active service? Roosevelt is not alarmed. He tells the British Prime Minister, I would minimize the general Soviet problems. Most of them will straighten out. To Churchill, the President's words give little comfort. In Washington, longer and wider views should have prevailed. American thought is disinterested in matters which relate to territorial acquisitions. But when the wolves are about, the shepherd must guard his flock, even if he does not care for the mutton. I must say that never in this war have I felt the responsibility weigh so heavily upon me, even in the darkest hours, as now, during this Yalta conference. I'd seen a good deal of uh, Stalin in Moscow on various occasions in negotiation with different British leaders. And I was particularly interested on this occasion to watch him conducting this triangular Duel. I quote from a note I made at the time. On the first day, Stalin sat for uh, an hour and a half or so uh, without saying a word. There was, in fact, no call for him to do so, as both the president and the prime minister had much to say. He just sat there taking it all in and being apparently rather amused. When he did chip in, he never used a superfluous word and spoke very much to the point. He's obviously got a, a good sense of humor and a rather quick temper. February 6th. The Yalta meeting takes up the problem of the structure of the Security Council of the United Nations. President Roosevelt submits his proposal. The Security Council will be composed of 11 member nations. 
five of which will be permanent. Russia, the United States, Britain, China, and France. Each member of the Security Council should have one vote. All large matters such as admitting or expelling states, suppressing or settling disputes, regulating armaments and providing armed forces will need the concurring votes of all the permanent members. The permanent member disagreeing can refuse its assent and stop the council doing anything. Here was the veto. Result? The Soviet Union is to invoke the veto 88 times in the years ahead. At Yalta, Stalin expresses his faith in the ideals of the United Nations. But these expressions are belied by his actions. We were all committed to see that both free elections and democratic governments were established in the countries occupied by the Allied armies. In Poland, we were as far as ever from any real attempt to obtain the will of the Polish nation by free elections. The Russian armies had given them complete control of Poland enforced by the usual deportations and liquidations. As the Yalta Conference draws to a close, Russia and the United States conclude a secret agreement. Stalin commits Russia to enter the war against Japan. In return, she is to receive a naval base in Manchuria and other concessions. Russia's participation in the war against Japan will extend exactly six days. Although Churchill signs the agreement on behalf of Great Britain, he says, I must make it clear that I took no part in making it. It was an American affair. We were only asked to approve. This we did. Sunday, February 11, was the last of our Crimean visit. Stalin, Roosevelt and I lunched in the Tsar's former billiard room at the Levadia Palace. During the meal, we signed the final documents. All now depended upon the spirit in which they were carried out. The Yalta Conference was held at a time when the war against Germany was very nearly at an end. And so political matters were coming very much to the fore. And it struck me at the time that whereas the conference of the type built up in the war, Casablanca, Quebec, Tehran, all these conferences on military matters, had been admirably suited to uh, the settlement of the strategy and tactics for the next six months with clear-cut conclusions which were then put into action. Uh, this method was quite unsuitable for political questions which involved the whole future of countries and for which very little preparation had been made beforehand. To settle such vast questions properly in a week was, I think, asking a great deal. And I believe that that is why everybody looks back on the Yalta Conference as one in which the Russians really got away with it. Before leaving Russian soil, the British Prime Minister visits nearby Balaclava, the battleground of the Crimean War. Here, French, Turkish and British troops fought against the expansion of Tsarist Russia. Here, the gallant 600 horsemen of the Light Brigade made their immortal charge into the Valley of Death.
altar, I noticed that the president was ailing. His captivating smile, his gay and charming manner had not deserted him, but his face had a transparency, an air of purification, and often there was a faraway look in his eyes. When I took leave of him in Alexandria Harbor, I must confess that I had an indefinable sense of fear that his health and his strength were on the ebb. February 27, 1945. In London, Winston Churchill reports on the results achieved at Yalta. On the very evening when I was speaking, a violation by the Russians of our agreements at Yalta took place in Romania. Vyshinsky, who had appeared in Bucharest, insisted that the all-party democratic government be dismissed. Soviet troops and tanks deployed in the streets, and on March the 2nd, a Soviet-dominated administration took office. I was deeply disturbed by this news which was to prove a pattern of things to come. This pattern of things to come is swiftly revealed. As the Red Army plunges toward Berlin and the growing friction between Russia and the West intensifies, Churchill issues another warning. A settlement must be reached on all major issues between the West and the East in Europe before the armies of democracy melt. The withdrawal of the U.S. Army to occupational lines would mean the tide of Russian domination sweeping forward in a front of 300 or 400 miles. This would be an event which, if it occurred, would be one of the most melancholy in history. There are millions of humble homes in Europe at the moment, in Poland, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, in Romania, in Bulgaria, where fear is the main preoccupation of family life. The fear of the ordinary family in Europe is for the life and liberty of the individual, for the fundamental rights of man, now menaced and precarious. 